I do want to also uh, acknowledge and thank all of our um, partners and sponsors. Um, a special shout out to uh, Video Pool Media Arts. Video Pool is going to be doing the workshop on uh, Saturday, a scratch workshop that will be part of the arcade. Also want to say thank you to the University of Winnipeg and the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Uh, also didn't sh thank uh, Social Sciences and Humanities uh, Council yesterday who definitely has had a large contribution to this event. <laughs> also to, to uh, Canada Council of the Arts for um, being able to have the Indigenous Curators Exchange here at the same time. It was such a beautiful opportunity uh, to work together on that. Also to, to Creative New Zealand, Australian Arts Council, and the Norway uh, Arts Council for bringing all of their uh, wonderful Indigenous curators and artists here uh, for us to have this kind of international dialogue. We are really uh, excited and uh, thankful to have all of these amazing voices in the room. And without further ado, I want to call up the Indigifem panel, which I am very excited about. And I'm just going to introduce Dr. Carla Taunton, who is an amazing collaborator and friend. And we have lots of fun. And this year, we're not able to drink wine at the symposium, but next time. What did you say? I said, this time we're not allowed to drink wine at the symposium. No, no, no next, next year. Next year. <laughs> but um, Carla is an associate professor at NASCAD University. She is also um, part of the GLAM Collective with myself and Heather. And <clears throat> she is on sabbatical this year. <laughs> Whew. And so I'm going to let you take it. Here's Great. the. Oh, this yeah. Is to the side. Great, thank you. OK, well, good morning, everyone. Um, when Julie asked me to moderate this panel and I saw the lineup, I was like, thank you. Um, it's a real honor and a, a sheer delight uh, to be chairing this session. Um, so without ado, I would like to introduce our incredible uh, panelists um, briefly. Uh, and then we will uh, have short, short conversations by each panelist. And we're hoping to have a, an actual dialogue session amongst these incredibly brilliant Indigenous women. Um, and then hopefully, we're a little, running a little bit late, but we hope to be able to actually engage you as well with some questions. Uh, so our first incredible speaker today is uh, Megan Tamati Quinnell, who is a curator of modern and contemporary Māori and Indigenous art at the Museum of, uh, Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa, and is of the Atiwa, sorry, Te Atiwa, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nati Mutanga, Kati Momoa, Mm, I'm not doing well this morning. <laughs> and the Tahu Iwe Mori descent. Hmm? Uh, uh, can you say? <laughs> <laughs> go, go for it. And you might come here to see. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Uh, Megan has uh, nearly 30 years of art curatorial experience and is a leading specialist in the field of modern and contemporary Modi art. Our next panelist is Joy Arkan who is a photo-based artist from the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, currently based in Ottawa, Ontario. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Saskatchewan in 2005. Along with Felicia Gay, she co-founded the Redshift Gallery, which is a fabulous space, a contemporary Aboriginal art gallery in Saskatoon in 2006. And in 2012, she founded Kimiwan Zine, a quarterly Indigenous arts publication. No. Speed reading. Okay. Next is uh, will be up uh, Tasha uh, Spillett, who is a Cree and Trinidadian woman, a celebrated educator, and an active member of Manitoba's Indigenous community. She is a ceremony woman and a traditional singer, often offering her voice at community gatherings. In her work as an educator, Tasha makes every effort to infuse her cultural knowledge into her teaching philosophy and practice to support the positive cultural identities of Indigenous students and to strengthen relationships between all communities. Our next speaker will be Jarita Gray Eyes, who is from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation and the Red Pheasant Cree Nation, both located in Treaty 6 territory, a graduate of the University of Winnipeg, woo, and University of Victoria, me as well, um, Masters of Arts in Leading Indigenous uh, Governance Program. Uh, she is currently the Director of Community Learning and Engagement at the University of Winnipeg. And our final speaker um, will be Jamie Isaac, uh, and is a, a Winnipeg-based interdisciplinary curator and artist, and is a member of the Saging in First uh, Treaty One Territory, 
Isaac holds a degree in art history from University of Winnipeg and a Master's of Arts from the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. You can do whatever you'd like, but we can eat lunch. Uh, probably standing. Yeah, standing is great. Though. Can we have some lights on the podium, please? Oh, they'll do it? Okay. Can I just push that? So that is me. <laughs> <laughs> so, ko ranga nui kei runga, ko papatua nuku kei raro, ko nga tangata kei wanga nui, ti hei mauri ora, kei te mihi a hau i te mātua nui i te rangi, nana nei nga mia katoa, i nga karangaranga maha i te whānau whānui, i te iwi whānui, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko te atea wa rau ko ngaitahu oku iwi, ko rani ere ere hana rau a ko hana nikuru wala oku tūpuna, no te wahi paunamu tōku ukai pō, ko Megan Tāmi ko ngā taku ingoa. The brief greeting I gave is a, as a mihi, to acknowledge my place in the world, to thank Julie and others for inviting me to be here, and to introduce myself. So I wanted to begin by talking about mana wahine Māori. Now I've written a whole paper, so I probably won't do the whole paper, because I understand we want to have a conversation. <laughs> um, so I'm going to cut it short, but... Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about mana wahine Māori, a, a, a form of Māori feminism, and through an exhibition I curated a couple of years ago called Two Artists, simply called Two Artists, Emily Karaka and Shona Rapira Davies. Now I decided just to call it Two Artists and their names because I figured if it was two male artists it would just be Paramatchet and Ralph Hūtere, it would not be, you know, mana wahine Māori or mana Māori man, well, tāne. Um, so both of them are consummate Manawahine Māori artists. Emily Karaka and Shona Rapira Davies are artists who rose to prominence in the mid-1980s. Both were part of a generation who were described by the late academic Dr Ranginui Walker as the first-born intelligentsia, an articulate and eloquent anti-colonial voice which emerged to argue for the shift in nationalism uh, to biculturalism. Prior to artists like Karaka and Rapira Davies, Māori women had little or no presence within the New Zealand art world. The show I put together focused on the work of these two senior Māori women artists, their practice uh, and their leadership. It focused on what they, independent of one another and perhaps without, without conscious intent, opened up for generations of Māori women. Um, their practices contra contrasted strongly through the works are selected. The exhibition showcased the differences in their individual practice, style and approach, but located them together as generational contemporaries and as artists of determination, power and vision. Curiously, they had never sh been shown together before, even though they knew one another and were kind of similar. So this is a work by Shona Rapira Davies, it's called Ngā Morihu, and it, Ngā Morihu means the survivors, and they are life-sized play women and they're delivering what we call the karanga and the karanga is the call of welcome that Māori women do and kind of um, usually senior women do it and so it goes through this thing. She covered them up. Originally she had them naked and she said that um, some, someone came into her studio when she was firing these women and uh, kind of made fun so she covered them in these black kind of shapeless outfits to really talk about the covering up of Māori women's sexuality through things like Christianity. And then she wrote text on them, and some of the text is completely derogatory, and it's really the stuff, the they're like scars, the things that women, Māori women particularly, carried. So things like, it says, you know, dirty Māori, Māori women are easy, lays, or, but it was a worse word, um, those kinds of things on, on them. Um, and there's a little poem, there's a, there's a poem on the child who's at the front, who's about the future, um, which talks about actually a tribal link between a particular tribe, hers and another tribe. The painting at the back is Emily Karaka. So Emily Karaka defines herself as an abstract expressionist painter. Her work is recognised through its expressive intensity, her use of high-key colour, into a gritty address of political issues related to land and the Treaty of Waitangi. 
She cites New Zealand artists Colin McCann and Philip uh, Claremont and a Māori artist Arnold Wilson amongst others as influences on her work as well as her father, her whakapapa or genealogy and family including her musician brother called Dilworth who was at a band called, I can't even remember what the band's called, it's gone out of my brain, um, and a painter Gretchen Albert was teaching her how to work with and not be afraid of colour. Um, shown at a Peter Davies as a sculptor who also has a drawing and painting practice. Her work is introspective and reflects the time it is made in. Her use of text uh, and her work express vulnerability and often pa a painful perspective into, and a view into a personal world. I mean, her work kind of makes me weep, Shona. Um, there's the, you can't see them very well, but there's drawings down this side, and they're about the removal of her. Her mother went crazy, and the children were all put into a children's home and split up, and it was about the removal of her brother and put into state care. So, and it's a remembered kind of, almost a lament, uh, it's called tangi drawings, a remembered kind of trauma uh, that it happened when she was like eight or nine years old. But she made them much later, obviously. But they're the most, it's like reading the pages of someone's diary. They're the most painful things, but also extraordinary that they're kind of up on paper and that you can read them and see them. Um, yeah, uh, her work, though, is not wholly located in the personal. It has correlation with a discourse about the social impact of colonisation, particularly related to Māori women and issues uh, to Māori sovereignty. It can also be defined, as Peter Davies says, by the person viewing it. Though Peter Davies is interested in process, she's particularly interested in process. When she was making those Ngāmori who figures, she used to ring me and talk to me about double helixes and how it would help the arms stay up and how the buried army of China once had giant skis that they stood on, but she had made it so they don't have that. Anyway, it was all like, okay, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> she took you with you where she went. She cites artists like Colin McCann, New Zealand artist Colin McCann and Ralph Horty as key influences on her practice, as well as a deep connection and grounding to the lands of Ngati Wai, where she comes from, which means uh, it's a place, it's called the Great Barrier Island, just off the top of Auckland, and Ngati Wai means the people of water, um, so spiritually and culturally that connection there, and to her kind of genealogy. So Manawahine Māori, this is Emily Kiraka's work called The Treaties. Um, Manawahine Māori, one of the spaces these two artists occupy, particularly when they first gained national attention, relates to the authority and power of Māori women and their right to define and represent their concerns, formed out of the momentum of the women's or feminist art movement and the Māori protest movement of the late 1970s, led by Māori women leaders such as the late Eva Rickard, Donna Awatiri, Lipika Evans, and the late filmmaker Mirata Mita, amongst others, and influenced by the Māori protest group Nga Tamatua. <coughs> Mana Wahine Māori was about making visible the narratives and experiences in all their diversity of Māori women. Karaka and Rapira Davies were the two were two of the first to embody issues of Māori sovereignty, Māori women's sovereignty within their artwork. Um, Karaka and Rapira Davies, like other women involved in Manawahini Māori, gave voice and visibility to Māori women and status within the art mainstream to Māori women's concerns. They were part of a generation that had become delusioned with the white monocultural uh, nationalism dominant in New Zealand in the 1970s and added their voice as art makers to the growing expression of Māori discontent at our loss of lands, lack of power and ma marginal status born of colonisation and the more recent assimilationist policies, policies of New Zealand of the 1950s and 60s that looked to make Māori New Zealanders. Uh, Manawahine Māori was part of the broader discourse of the Māori protest movement. It was a tool of analysis, particularly treaty analysis, and an ingredient in the larger decolonising decolonizing agenda and can be valued as a form of Māori political activism. More than simply a Māori version of feminism in which the inflation and maintenance of male power over women was seen as unacceptable, Manawahine Māori, like Māori women's identity, was bound up culturally and spiritually with landscape and geography. 
primary elements of the movement included a whakapapa, or a connection to land and place, and status as tangata whenua, or the people of that place. Feminist art had the principal aims of ensuring independent, self-defining female voice, voices could be heard, for women's art to be a witness, to show women to women themselves, and to re-educate men in what woman was, including changing typecasts and providing different archetypes. Mana wahine Māori embraced some of those ideas related to gender, but different from feminism, it drew strongly on the acts and actions of tūpana wahine, or female ancestors, um, as foundations for Māori women's well-being, and cited tenoranga tiratanga, or Māori sovereignty, and the recognition of the Treaty of Waitangi as key ideals at the heart of their unrest. So this was more holistic and about the culture, not just male-female. Um, the following statements from artist Kura Tewari Rewari encompass uh, mana wahine Māori positioning. She said, I am a Māori artist. I use my Māoriness as a base for my works, which are strongly motivated by politics, me and my tūpuna, or ancestors, me and my land, me and my whānau, or family, me as a Māori woman, me as a tangata whenua of Aotearoa, as a Māori artist, I try to embrace the tapu nature or the sacred nature of being Māori, the tapu nature of our tikanga or our ways of being, of our wairua, of our spirit, and our whole being in order to reconstruct and redefine what it is that we had. <coughs> so that's, just, I'll just show you some, that's some kura's paintings. I just want to quickly touch on this and then I'll sit down. Interesting though, the platform for Mana Wahine Māori was perhaps established in part by the work and focus of a handful of Māori women active as artists and educators in the 1950s and 60s. Now Heather will know this. I delivered a paper in South Africa that looked at the genre and gender in indigenous modernism called A Seat at the Table that highlighted the work of Māori modernist artists Kath Brown, Naitahu, Katarina Mataira, Ngāti Parau and Marilyn Webb, Ngāti Kahu, Te Rōrua, who were the most high profile Māori women engaged in art in this period and who had the most information about. The paper took its lead from the Australian artist, art historian Ian McLean's 2013 essay, Surviving the Contemporary, What Indigenous Artists Want and How to Get It, and feminist artist Judy Chicago's epic art installation, The Dinner Party, 1979. McLean said, to even find a seat at the table, Indigenous art first has to be accepted as contemporary art, this has been the de defining struggle in the modern era. The problem, at least until recently, was that the Western tradition of modernism <coughs> circumcised, uh, circumscribed the, the terms, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> circumscribed the terms of contemporary art. This meant that indigenous artists had to first prove their modernity, a catch-22 game, how embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> that could never win without disavowing their indigeneity. McLean's phrase was used as a metaphor to emphasise the exclusion until recently of Māori modernism practices within New Zealand art history and to highlight the emergence of modernism as an alternative modernism and as a focus of research as new. It underlined that Māori modernism is a revisionist history which is still being explored. Chicago's The Dinner Party 1975 uh, 79 was a reference more particularly to the women of Māori modernism, although we perhaps were not at that table either as it celebrated women of Western civilization. Even in our own art history, the contribution of women, Māori women, uh, of modernism is yet to be properly uh, proclaimed. Their contribution is less visible than their male contemporaries as their art, with the exception of Marilyn Webb, who was one of them, was not collected by art galleries and their focus became less about art. So um, all three uh, ended up working and uh, their work became much more about other things, not just visual arts. Uh, this is an early uh, educator, Māori Wimakono, which is my cousin Arisha's grandmother. Um, a woman called Miri Kururangi again, who was in the art advisory, they did these publications called The Single Poi and took uh, Māori art into schools. Uh, Kath Brown is one of the ones I was talking about. She ended up working not as full-time as an artist, but as a kind of facilitator and educator and worked within a tribal context, like growing art and arts ideas at a kind of a tribal level. 
Um, she did this book on kitty making. Um, Georgina Kirby, who was a woman um, who was a painter and was independent, wasn't part of the educators, but um, was a modernist painter and took painting lessons from a woman called Louise Henderson, ran one of the first art galleries, uh, uh, independent kind of art galleries. Um, another woman called Pauline Yearbury, um, a woman called Media Lodge, uh, Elizabeth Ellis, um, this is Katarina Matida, who ended up working with language. So really, um, and, and decided with urbanisation that te reo or language and that retention became much more important than making work. And the last one is Marilyn Webb, who's pictured here, who had a lot of environmental concerns within her work in the 70s and still does. So the catch cry of land, culture and language really became catch cries for the Māori protest movement of the, seven, of the 70s, 80s and right through to the 90s. And that is me, so I will sit down. So our next speaker is Joy Arcon. Good morning, everyone. Tanse Joy Arkan, Natsika Sud, Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, Ochinia. My name is Joy Arkan, and I'm from Muskeg Lake, which is in Treaty 6 territory. Um, I wanted to share uh, some current and not so current projects with you um, as we travel through time, as we do. Um, so, I'm going to share a recent cur curatorial project. Uh, that I worked on this past year called Language of Puncture and also how it relates to my visual arts practice uh, through recent commissions such as works for Insurgents Resurgence and at the Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff. Um, I have prioritized language in language learning in my life recently. Uh, for me, an indigenous future includes speaking our languages uh, which connects us to our past, our ancestors, and the land. Um, as a non-speaker, I would like to acknowledge all the language keepers who are here and the teachers I've worked with throughout my life, such as Joseph um, Netauho, Dolores Sand, Belinda Daniels, Gladys Wabas, Daryl Tramakis, Randy Morin, Mike Hookham, Augustine Arcand, and uh, numerous aunties and uncles. Okay, so this is a uh, language of puncture. In her monumental textbook, Nowhere Else, Chicana artist Alicia Reyes Bechtemera quotes the Cuban American poet Gustavo Perez Fermat. The fact that I'm writing to you in English already falsifies what I wanted to tell you. My subject, how to explain to you that I don't belong to English, though I belong nowhere else. Although Perez Fermat and Reyes McNamara are referring to the respective relationships to the Spanish language, bilingualism, and the hybrid language of Spanglish, the plaster-covered words corner me as a non-speaker of my language. The words are difficult to decipher, carrying the weight of not knowing one's language. Outside the gallery was a site-specific work by Anishinaabe Collective, Ogibao Migana, Susan Blight, and Hayden King. The collective has done several public interventions in Toronto since Idle No More, promoting language reclamation and re revitalization. This copper stenciled message appeared on a soon to be destroyed freeway, which will ironically take the gallery with it. The text is spray painted in Anishinaabemowin relates or translates to, all walls crumble, the land remains. I'm gonna read a little excerpt of their write up for this project. The Anishinaabe endure. We do so through settler colonial time and across space. We do so in contention. Untitled, All Walls Crumble considers this movement. To be indigenous in the city is so often a struggle for recognition, to be seen and to resist the erasure that is common in Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, etc. Yet with recognition also comes appropriation and co-optation. 
In this unease, we consider the benefits of erasure or at least covert movement. Inspired by stories of our relatives and ancestors counting coup and Basil Johnson's description of warfare more generally, the Ogama Mikina project considers the tension between visibility and invisibility to challenge settler colonial, colonial logic. Against the crumbling wall holding up Ottawa's major highway, scheduled for demolition and replacement, we draw attention to the ways the settler state recycles itself and by extension affirms its legitimacy. We see it and resist in provocative ways that mirror a there, not their presence. Against this crumbling wall, we reclaim space for anti-recognition. To speak to each other as Anishinaabe, as communities pushed out by gentrification, as the colonized, and offer a refrain and a sign of defiance. Um, I'm gonna butcher this, so I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> Uh, so it translates to uh, all walls crumble, but the land remains. Uh, these are some installation shots of the exhibition, which was at Gallery 101 in Ottawa. Uh, in the background, you can see a piece by Amy Melboff. Uh, it's a white bone bead on white tarp, and what it says is a derogatory phrase about a midshift person stated by a non-indigenous band from the, in the 1800s. Uh, the words are all di difficult to decipher and Amy refuses to let us know what it says. This work is by Wes Harmon, a carrier artist based in Vancouver. Their work speaks to the gentrification happening uh, in their neighborhood of East Vancouver. Their hand-drawn fonts spell out affirmations of indigeneity, often employing humor and colloquial speech, claiming these spaces as indigenous. Cree artist Audrey Drever's internal dialogue of not knowing her language pop up in thought and speech bubbles in her series, No, I Don't Speak Cree, which she considers her inability to speak Cree means uh, in which she considers whether her inability to speak Cree means that she is less Cree. The frustrations of being unable to pass down her language to her son are illustrated in her work. Oops. Anishinaabe artist Roland Soulier's large-scale barricades, modern-day syllabics hold 52 panels, each symbol representing a sound. The barricades can be read as a physical manifestation of the barriers faced by um, indigenous second language learners. The panels can be moved around, rearranging the static letters into a living language. Some more installation. So this is um, my work, Ote Nigan Misue Askik, or Here in the Future, All Over the Earth. Um, I began working with Daryl Chamakis um, from Chittick Lake in 2007. We met working at the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Center in Saskatoon. I have worked there on and off for the past 10 years as a publishing technician and graphic designer. In my day job, I spent a lot of time designing and typing in the seven languages represented at the center. Dene, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, Soto, Plains, Woodland, and Swampy Cree. Uh, the way I've been exposed to and have been learning the language throughout my life, it was in these daily interactions where it began to seep into my psyche. For example, <laughs> although I'm not Dene and cannot speak Dene, I was able to understand its rhythms and structure through its written form. At the same time, I was learning stories about Cree syllabics and began seeing the shapes and letter forms in traffic signs and symbols. The Cree syllabary contains the worldview of the people within its glyphs. These visual markers tell their own stories of strength and resistance, and as designer Chris Lee argues, should be considered as a contribution to indigenous typographic history. When I study them, I begin to connect shapes with sounds. As American artist Evan Heath describes, I am listening with my eyes. Oh, there's a lot. 
<laughs> uh, the most recent work I've created is a series I've called Wayfinding. And it's a series of four illuminated signs uh, currently installed in three separate locations. This one is in Toronto in an exhibition called Morning Star, co-curated by Jason Berg. Um, this one's there too. <laughs> and this one is here, upstairs. And this one was a commission by the Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff, which will be up, uh, I think, until next summer sometime. Uh, so these words speak to uh, one another over time and space. They convey a frustration in not understanding and learning the language. Um, as Felicia Gay wrote, uh, these works are meant as a public intervention to relay to the public an indigenous-centered worldview and what would implicate if indigenous languages were as visible as English and French? What would shift in power, what would this shift in power implicate? How would the lives of indigenous women and two-spirit be treated politically and civically if Canada was indigenous centered through language? The end. Okay, so our next speaker, speaker is Tasha. Thank you. Dearest ones, I can only imagine your faces when I squeeze my eyes tightly and allow my thoughts to drift away from climate disaster, resource extraction project announcements, and the public executions of black and brown bodies documented in shaky iPhone videos that get curated in Facebook feeds between ads for Forever 21 and trailers for the newest Armageddon type movie. On the day that I sat down to begin to write you this letter, the cyber news headlines read, remains of Christine Wood found near Winnipeg. Today, there's a mama who once sat and imagined her babies, as I now sat, sit and imagine you existing in her very own nightmare. The article reads, the remains of a young indigenous woman have been found just outside of Winnipeg, more than nine months after she disappeared. Christine Wood, 21, vanished in August of last year after leaving a Winnipeg hotel. Wood had been visiting the city with family from their home in Oxford House, a remote First Nation community in northern Manitoba. On Thursday, Wood's remains were, buried in a, were found buried in a ditch by a farmer in Springfield who was checking his crops. Dearest ones, it is my greatest sorrow that one day you will learn how trauma wakes up trauma. Christine Wood's name is now attached to the thousands of other names of women who could have been your aunties. Names that I carry with me like iron casted flower petals overflowing from a basket made of cracked willow ribs. Dearest ones, I hope you're born with my mother's hands the only ones that I know that are strong enough to hold such an inheritance. The Thunderbirds came back to visit yesterday after their long departure from our territory. I wished for them. My thoughts are, my thoughts are silenced by their loud singing and dancing. I think they came back to bring their medicine to the people and the land, both grieving for their lost relative. I wonder if the land and the water hurt like we do when one of ours is stolen from our circle. Do they ache? Is this what makes storms and earthquakes? If it were you that were stolen, I would be a never ending hurricane. Dearest ones, you come from a long line of women reaching back to the original life source that continues to manifest creation and bodies that wars were and continue to be waged upon. If you're existing in physical form, it's only because the life force of these women lives in you because it lived in me. If you're existing in physical form, it's because my heart won a long debate with my mind. 
that pushed and pulled between being fear too fearful for your own safety to call you forward and having so much faith in your goodness and strength that it quieted the fear. If you're existing in physical form, I hope you know by now that you come from such strong people and belong to such a beautiful territory. I hope you've experienced the magic of sipping water over the side of a canoe at Clearwater Lake. I hope the water at Clearwater Lake is still clear. I hope you felt tiny, surrounded by miles of rock and birch trees and know the sweetness of wild blueberries. I hope you know how, I hope you know how it feels when your body burns and tingles when you come in from off a frozen lake. I hope you've been lost on the land, but not scared. Dearest ones, as I write this, my ability to hope for these things, to hope for you, is being swallowed up by forces that are far out of my own control. I squeeze my eyes tighter and try to imagine your faces, but I'm met with thoughts of the earth heating up too much to sustain life and water and, and people warring for water. I wrote down all my fears the other day. I needed them to be somewhere else other than my mind, and paper seemed like much a safer place to keep them. I took this paper marked with fear and turned those fears into questions. I bought those questions to some of your aunties, women who helped me to understand the world and who helped me to walk through it. I want to begin to introduce you to these aunties. Uh, this is a segment of a piece that I wrote um, at a part in my scholarship when I was being asked to critically consider the relationship between women and our land bases, uh, which is completely um, and non is completely non separable from the erasure of our histories, of our languages, of our artworks, um, and the near erasure of our bodies. Also. Um, at this point in my scholarship, I was, I was looking really at epistemicide, which is the killing of knowledge. And, and recently, um, I, I started to, to turn my back on thinking about the killing of our knowledge and, and rather look directly on what it looks up to wake up story that exists in our bones. Uh, and for me, that, that is the future of indigenous feminism is the absolute, um, the absolute knowing that we have a right to hope for our future uh, and that we are a living example of that hope uh, today. And I think that, um, I think that that, that that is beautiful and transformative and as, as one of my sis, new sisters, Karen Recolay, said in an interview we did yesterday, an example of radical love, which I, which I completely um, appreciate. And so I have no answers, but what I do have is amazing aunties and sisters in which we can continue to have these dialogues and conversations. And so like you, I'm looking for answers, so I would rather leave space for some time and dialogue to have that conversation. Can I ask him and Nagel say? Thank you so much, Tasha. That was absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Jurita. Bonjour and Dinawe Magnatuk, Jurita Gayas and Dishnakas, Omashkego Kweni, Maskego Sagahiganik and Doji, Tanse ni Wagomagana, Jurita Grays and Sigasun, Maskeo Sagahiganik, Otsinia, Nia Neheya Esqueo, Notawi, Ogimau, Glen Kiskitek and Ipan and Sigaso, Nigawi, Carol Grays and Sigaso. My name is Jurita Gray Eyes, and uh, I am very grateful to be on Treaty One territory as a visitor from Treaty Six. Um, I opened um, in the Anishinaabe Bamboo language as a sign of respect um, and, uh, and honoring the graciousness of uh, my host, the Anishinaabe people here. Um, and it's so interesting because, uh, you know, these are all uh, longtime friends and collaborators, and we didn't really talk about what we we're going to say, but um, I think they're all very connected. So, uh, really, uh, a joy to be here. <laughs> 
with uh, my friends and relatives. And um, uh, I also want to acknowledge, um, as a second language learner of both um, Nehewewin and Anishinaabemowin, um, to acknowledge my teachers too. So uh, the late Frida Henneke, um, Dolores Greer Sand, Delvin Kennedy, Daryl Chamakis, Joseph Natalho, who's here, uh, Randy Morin, and as a guest here and a student of Anishinaabemowin, um, I've really learned a lot from Annie Belanger, uh, Wabanaquat Canoe, uh, Jason Peronto, and Darren Crochane. So uh, when we were thinking about uh, the future, I thought it was really important to understand um, the context in which we imagine the future as Indigenous women. And how I've come to understand uh, our current state is um, to be an Indigenous woman and to imagine the future is to recognize that we're living in a perpetual state of grief. And so we are grieving many things. And I think the first is the dislocation from our land. Um, and so that is uh, something that we feel um, historically, continually ongoing. Um, when we look at um, our, our relatives to the south, Standing Rock, we understand that um, the dislocation from land is not something that um, has happened in the past, but is a current and ongoing um, issue. And we also think about, you know, you've heard several people before me um, speak our languages. Um, when we look to Joy's work and about this uh, imagining a new future, it is about um, a connection to the language. And I think all of us um, as uh, young people, we have committed ourselves um, to doing our best to relearn the languages. And we also grieve um, the loss of those languages, which was, um, you know, we didn't lose it. It was a, a, a systematic attempt um, to disconnect us from land and the languages and cultures that came from that land. And, uh, you know, we're also grieving um, from the systems uh, that really were a key actor in this dislocation, which is the residential school system. So as an intergenerational uh, survivor of the residential school experience, um, I understand that uh, the state has been a key actor in the dislocation of my family from our land and our language. And that has also translated into dislocations that we also grieve from our family. And so I think we look to um, our friends, our relatives, um, and we think about Tasha Hubbard's work. So Birth of a Family uh, is her latest project, and I think is really a, a wonderful um, story about this dislocation and how, you know, in our many stages of grief, we grief the loss of our relatives. We grief um, the loss of that family that we had always hoped for and wanted. And to be an Indigenous woman is also um, to grieve the loss of our people that we may not know but see reflected in ourselves. So when I first uh, moved to Winnipeg three years ago, uh, the summer of that uh, was the summer that um, the late Tina Fontaine, who was 15 years old, um, who was murdered and uh, put into a trash bag and thrown into the Red River. And so that summer when I came here, you know, I had never met Tina, um, but I thought about her often. Sorry. <laughs> because we know that even despite our um, maybe um, relative privilege as people who are educated, who have jobs, that that very easily could happen to our nieces, our sisters, our aunts, our parents. And so this constant state of grief it was one in which we recognize our own vulnerability, but also the systems that have created um, that vulnerability. And so, um, you know, we are not uh, imagining the future in a context in which we have any sort of semblance of um, safety or security. We are in a state of perpetual grief. Um, and that is where we imagine the future from. But, of course, even in our uh, darkest moments, there are wonderful um, uh, bright spots. And so uh, when we pitched this panel, I was like, well, 
we should probably call it Indigifem the future because it's, it's the indigenous women who are doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> And I think in the current era, so in Canada, for our guests who are here, um, you know, we're in the era of reconciliation, um, which I'm not, I'm currently, I don't really know what that means. Um, but I think it's really interesting that I think the, uh, the primary voices and the public voices of reconciliation, particularly for indigenous people, have been men. And I think there is like, a deep disconnect between the performative um, pieces around reconciliation and the substantive action that actually um, is working towards um, restoring the harms and um, creating the spaces for our communities and families to connect and heal. And that's, that's being done by indigenous women. Um, and so when I look um, to the work that all of the people here are doing, um, and uh, when I think about the representations of uh, the future that we want to see, um, I look to the projects that um, we've been involved in. So Joy um, founded Kim Wan Zine, and um, as a collaborator on that project, uh, my number one role is like to be Joy's cheerleader <laughs> in all of her projects, which is a wonderful role. Um, and I think for me, uh, why I wanted to support um, Joy's work on that project was really because it was about um, women uh, deciding how we wanted to work as a collective um, and then um, acknowledging the efforts um, of other indigenous women who were creating um, really amazing um, pieces of art. And despite this um, context of perpetual grief in which we create things, um, have created really wonderful visions of the future. And so there was a few projects that I think uh, I think really spoke to me. So, you know, Joy's Here on Future Earth projects, um, the reimagining of our current territories and places where we live um, and work uh, as being uh, indigenized through this uh, use of syllabics in our everyday world. Um, and I think we also, um, you know, I was asked to be part of the Indian Super Meeting series. So we had awesome trading cards in which we had our superpowers and my superhero alter ego is Jay Gray, and um, I harness the, uh, the power of the thunder beings in a bolt, and I eviscerate heteropatriarchal colonialism uh, with my super bolt. And um, I think that's a wonderful um, way to think about it, because I think all of the indigenous women that I know and um, artists who are creating this uh, new imagination, this new future, um, really are doing it in a way that's uh, and grounded in actually doing the work. Um, we aren't talking about it, we're doing it. And so when I think about the future, um, you know, I think about uh, Wendy Red Star's Thunder Up Above series, and uh, I think about Jingle Dressing, Jingle Dress Dancing on the Moon. So thanks, Zane. Thank you so much. Our next, our last speaker is Jamie. But I'll figure it out. Oh, there's my free cake. <laughs> Daphne Ojig. Good morning, I'm Jamie Isaac, um, Curator of Contemporary Indigenous Arts here at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. I'm um, Ojibwe Anishinaabe, member of Saguin First Nation, and um, my name that was gifted to me in 2009, and um, I am for the first time presenting it to an audience. Um, White Thundercloud Woman. Wabushi Kanana Quad Ikwe. And Nana's like, no. <laughs> 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 so it's <laughs> close. <laughs> it's, a, it's a process. 
So I just wanted to um, start by expressing my gratitude um, to Julie um, and this amazing group of people, um, this awesome, amazing panel, um, and the Winnipeg Art Gallery um, for um, you know, helping to make this happen and um, really just uh, providing the space for these kinds of dialogues and for the amount of space that Julie and I took up for this show. <laughs> and although there may be, um, as was mentioned yesterday, um, no cultural signifiers or um, visual identities within this space, I think that um, our power and spirit in conversation and our sharing of stories um, are those really powerful signifiers. So the intent of this presentation this morning is to um, really take you through a bit of a photo album or um, a scrapbook um, to present uh, an enactment, an enactment, a demonstration of, in, of theory of indigenous feminism, indigenous curatorial praxis as a braided process of indigenizing, decolonizing, and self-determining. So I hope you don't mind that it's going to be personal and um, it's going to be like showing you a bit of a family album. Daphne Ojig, um, co-founder of the Professional Native Indian Artists Incorporation with Norval Morriso, otherwise known as the Indian Group 7, and founder of the New Warehouse Gallery in Winnipeg from 1971 to 1976. The reason why she opened up her own gallery was because she was, um, wasn't showing in contemporary art contexts and contemporary galleries, and she wasn't invited within those spaces at that time. And she was still, uh, and of her contemporaries and, and the artists that she worked with, um, weren't being um, shown in that contemporary context. So she opened up her own gallery. And I think um, that many, and I've heard other people, um, other women curators and artists, call her sort of a, a grandmother of um, the arts world uh, and indigenous feminism. When my son saw this um, this morning, Thunderbird Woman, um, he's like, is that Wonder Woman? Like, <laughs> Yeah, kind of. <laughs> so when thinking about indigenous feminism and the idea of, of the panel, I thought about all the really amazing artists, um, indigenous artists and indigenous curators that really paved the way uh, for me to be able to be up here today. Um, and then I thought about all the scholars and people that I had quoted in my thesis and continued to quote. And then I thought, you know, further back um, of, the, of my family. And so um, there are pillars. I come from a, a really strong line of matriarchs that continue to inform and influence my practice. My nana, um, residential school survivor. My mom, a residential school survivor, intergenerational. And my auntie Bebs, um, who's also a leader in the community um, in ceremony. And I thought, you know, further back, as they tell me their stories of um, their line and before them, and um, the leadership and, and um, leadership in their communities, and one of them was um, a midwife. And so I think about the role of, of um, motherhood in terms of, in brackets, of indigenous feminism. Um, my mom, my sister, and my nana um, work together quite often. And um, they do workshops to teach about intergenerational trauma and resilience. 
Um, they think through Canadian policies um, such as the Indian residential schools and their impacts on um, Indigenous families and motherhood. And to think about ideas or notions of reconciliation, um, in my own practice, I think to their knowledge and their scholarship uh, and their actions in community. So uh, a few residencies that I've been a part of um, were around really talking about reconciliation and asking what that meant. And at the time, I, um, I, had, a, I had a child um, uh, right before some of these residencies started. And so to think about the idea of reconciliation is to also think through intergenerationally. Um, so before me, um, present, and to think about the future. And I couldn't possibly think about being at a residency or some of these conferences without my five-month-year-old or five-month son with me um, because he's the next generation and he's the, the generation in the future that we were speaking to. So um, I, I think about the colonial patriarchy's impact on indigenous family and women and children and these relationships. And I think about my role as an indigenous feminist. And I think that really started as a mother. And to have a sort of sense of um, empowered motherhood and that my son would just be coming to these residencies and these conferences. And I had a really an amazing group of um, artists and curator communities. So in the middle, um, Picture, you see Adrian Stimson, Leah Dechter, myself, Cheryl Rondell, and Chris Boyce, and my son, who's, being, um, who's on Leah Dechter's lap. And as he kind of got restless, it, he was passed down this panel. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just really amazing to have that sense of community and that work could still get done. Um, the picture here with this big baby head is my son um, at six weeks old at an I Don't Know More um, round dance, a polo park. And um, that was just really important to have him with me. And there's this sense of we can't go there, we can't do this, uh, we can't be a part of this, we can't, we've got to take a break from all of the things that we're passionate about because we're looking after our little ones. Um, and I think it's detrimental to the future of their knowledge. Um, and so just bring the kids <laughs> is, is what my nana and what my mom taught me. Kathy Mattis um, is also uh, very important to me um, as a mentor. Uh, we did a formal mentorship through the Manitoba Arts Council. and. Um, she introduced me to the Aboriginal and Curatorials Collective and um, uh, to women at Mentoring Artists for Women's Art. And um, she wasn't an easy mentor. Kathy, are you in the audience? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but that's a good thing. You, you, you push the crit criticality. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Um, and, and, um, and going back to this sort of way of, of curating and um, thinking about my role in, in indigenous feminism is um, storytelling. So as you know, my Nana just spoke before me and she's a wonderful storyteller. And when I was talking to my mom yesterday about, you know, I'm kind of nervous about this panel. I, I want to be able to present in this um, photo album kind of way in a, in a relaxed personal way, but I just can't tell good stories like Nana can. And my son was kind of half listening and his yogurt is all over his face and he's like, Mommy, I think you, you tell delightful stories. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm trying to tell you a story I guess today. I also work with an amazing sisterhood um, collective called the Ephemerals, and um, 
This is a, a still from the first film that we made, made in Indian, uh, with Nikki Little and Jenny Western, myself. We've worked on uh, several projects together, and um, I can tell you a little bit about them as we go along. Oh, go back. Okay. So we're an interdisciplinary group of curators and artists, and we focus on um, performance and film and curating as artists. And we've, we've collaborated um, with other artists um, in our practice, Scott Benesina Bannon, um, Carrie Lynn Reeves, and a whole host of other people that have been involved in our public performances and flash mobs. Um, one of the first things we did was to do um, uh, an exhibition called Trending at the University of Winnipeg. And we restaged it then um, as an iteration called Re Trending 2014 at the First Nations University of Canada in Regina. Uh, trending at the University of Winnipeg uh, in 2011 was a display from the ethnographic collection and found objects of our own. Um, with It's a three-month exhibition that changed, and every month we changed our display um, to talk about ideas of identity and um, cultural appropriation. Uh, we had a couple of different perform performative embedments throughout the University of Winnipeg uh, with a bake sale, a flash mob, um, we took over the radio show, student interviews, and a blog. As I said, the exhibition discussed issues of cultural appropriation in, pop in popular culture, indigenous identity, and material culture, and it included as is important to us, a multitude of voices and methods. Um, 2012, we had uh, kids, and we didn't mean to do this. Um, <laughs> in, I, I didn't mean it that way. We didn't mean to do it together. They were all a wonderful surprise. Um, but we're really starting to think about our roles as um, mothers and engaging with our culture and um, enacting theories of indigenous feminisms. Um, and part of that was um, with the retrending in, in Regina, we had really amazing people to work with, Catherine Boyer and um, Judy Anderson. And Judy was really amazing because she kind of recognized that we were a little bit like, how are we going to get this work done and also look after our little ones? And she's like, oh, I'm just going to take the kids for a walk. And so she did that a few times, and I really appreciate um, her, her there and all of the great women that, um, that were there to help and recognized that we wanted to put this exhibition on and talk through these ideas. So in 2014, um, that summer, we were involved in um, Plug-in Institute's Summer Institute. Um, and it was an institute thinking about ideas of feminism or feminism. And um, we thought, well, our kids are young, one and a half and two. We could bring them or we could try um, find care for them. And, um, and have the stress of them having separation anxiety while we're trying to get work done. It was in the summer. And we just, we ended up bringing them. And to bring them into a contemporary art context um, was interesting uh, to begin with because we had a lot of raised eyebrows and um, thinking that this wasn't a place for kids. And, um, it was interesting kind of negotiating those institutional spaces that way and to assert um, our presence, their presence in these ideas that we were talking about, which was indigenous feminisms. And um, throughout the week, other mothers with little ones were like, yeah, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna bring my, my kid as well. And 
we ended up getting work done and none of the art was um, messed with. And um, we had these really interesting conversations and we sort of shifted the idea of uh, the fact that these, um, these little ones were, were welcome in that space and welcome in that narrative of our, our, of our futures. So we made little t-shirts for them and um, a, a bunch more for other people coming in on the open, um, open day, which was called, this is what a feminist looks like with the mini um, a little bit bigger. Oftentimes we've worked with um, my grandmother um, and one of the projects that we were invited to do was to do um, a intervention with the University of Manitoba's Indigenizing the Academy. And um, instead of really giving a, a longer talk, we um, made a sign and um, put it up on Alumni Road. And um, we didn't ask for permission. Uh, and we asked my, my nana what the sort of translation of alumni might be. And, um, and through different texts and emails and conversations on the phone, uh, she came up with Kagi Ayawatoma. Did I say that right? Um, <laughs> and it, it translates to those that were here before us. And uh, I thought that was really amazing to think about. You know, it's still Alumni Road in a way, um, but it's also referencing a history um, much longer uh, than the university being there. And um, we were honoring the alumni, but also the original inhabitants of the land. And this is sort of our gesture or intervention of indigenizing the academy. I think it stayed up for two months, and we're still kind of trying to find where our sign might be. Um, we uh, just recently finished a film, and um, it's called Afterbirth. And we also worked with uh, my Nana and some um, amazing collaborators, Becca Taylor and Brie Little, um, to help with the clothes and sew and dye. And so um, if you're here, thank you, Miigwech, for your help with this project. I think our whole family came when we were doing the, the filming of it. And um, we thought about uh, the idea that tradition isn't static. And um, we wanted to return to our, fa our, our thinking about ceremony and the learning process of honoring that ceremony. And um, that was to give back the um, ideas of original motherhood and life the, as the life cycle process, um, and to honor the emotional, mental, and spiritual work of motherhood. We thought about our responsibilities um, as women and mothers and people in our community that speak to um, part of intergenerational trauma is the healing through language and through, and through culture and revitalizing that. Uh, Kim Anderson says that it was the emotional intelligence of motherhood that really transformed me into an indigenous feminist. And I think I really um, side with that and I think that um, for me, it was really important, and I know for um, Jenny and for Nikki, um, this, this sort of transformation um, into, into motherhood. And we did that together, and we did it with a whole community. So as I said, I, I've worked with my, um, my nana and my mom and family um, in my art and curatorial practice and um, I made a light box, in, light box installation of uh, the residential school in um, Fort Alexander, Seguin First Nation. And um, I 
had talked with my mom and with my nana about how they would feel um, about their histories being um, so public. And um, it was a really interesting process and just in terms of the dialogue that we had. And I was really um, happy that Michelle Lavalley and David Garneau um, brought this into their exhibition called Moving Forward, Never Forgetting. This was also um, a body of work within that, um, with a maquette of the residential school that was torn down um, and deconstructed by the community. And it um, went with a film uh, of this sort of intergenerational anger um, of the residential school and the residue that it has left on our communities and our families. Um, back to curating. Um, here at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, the first exhibition that I curated was called We Are on Treaty Land. And it was with uh, nine artists of the um, Treaty One territory or artists that had made significant bodies of work uh, around the Treaty One territory. We partnered with the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba and um, invited their knowledge keepers and elders into the space um, to approve the show before it went um, public. They also worked with me on some of the labels and the, um, and, and the, the didactic. Uh, this was an exhibition called Kwek Chige Win, Making Good. And it was an exhibition um, in, from June to September 2016. And um, it was about sort of negotiating or thinking about notions of reconciliation and enacting one of the Truths um, and Reconciliation Commission's uh, calls to action. And um, we worked with an elders council and the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation as a partner. Um, to think about and bring in resources um, and a history of the TRC. We worked with uh, 14 non-Indigenous and Indigenous artists in Canada. Uh, we worked, I did a show called Vernon Aki Kant Chant um, in November 2016 to April 2017. And um, it was a sister exhibition to Border X. And Border X was um, a kind of a heart project for me. It was a show I probably would have wanted to curate if I knew what curating was uh, when I was 13. And so I was able to sort of return to um, that time. And um, it included mostly men, one woman in the show. And I think that was also really indicative of um, the time and the, the culture, um, because it's still very much um, a male-dominated do um, area in, in surfing, skateboarding, and snowboarding. Um, so I often was like, I don't think I'm being a, a feminist with this show, because there's only one other woman in the show. And um, I invited Kaylee Cornell, Lydia Herbling, and Julie Nagam are scholars, but they also ride, and they reflected on, on ideas of, of borders um, and um, boarding culture as a way to negotiate land and respond to the land and thinking through ideas of territorialism. And I think back about why this was so important, and I still center it as um, a sort of feminist, uh, in indigenous approach to curating, because when I started snowboarding and, and skateboarding, I, um, uh, it was the first time, really, that I had a feminist position and recognized a feminist position. Um, within that world. Um, and my stance politically negotiating land and, and territory. So as a first political and feminist stance, 
um, I was often told, oh, you're good for a girl. And I was like, I'm just good. Um, I'm so, uh, I have so much gratitude um, to the Winnipeg Art Gallery, um, to all of the artists involved, and especially um, my very good friend, and as Julie says, a cohort, um, co-conspirator. And uh, we did this show together in Insurgents Resurgence, and I'm not really going to talk much about it because it's upstairs right now, and we have a catalog. Uh, in the gift shop. So I, I just wanted to say that um, we, it was so amazing to work with Julie, um, with the staff at the WAG, um, Destiny Seymour as the exhibition designer, um, Scott Benassine and Bannon as um, the, the document, documenter of the show, and all of the just amazing artists that just pushed it and um, joy being one of the artists. Her wonderful work is on the stairwell and in the elevator. It can't be missed. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to say Kinan and Dinaway Maganak, all my relations. Miigwech. So unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, so I hope and I invite you all to bring your questions to this incredible uh, group of speakers. I would just like to personally thank you um, for such beautiful, uh, powerful, and fierce uh, presentations, but also for the work that you all continue to do.